And welcome to The Buzz. Thank you, John. Well, you've traveled extensively, both here and abroad, and you write about it in your uh, tossoffthebowlines.com uh, website and where you post your blog. Tell, tell us a little bit first about your background and, and growing up in different parts of the world. Well, um, I'm an army brat, so travel is in my blood. I have a brother born in Japan, a brother born in Oklahoma, a brother born in France, and then a brother and I were born in California. We were the boring ones. But uh, so my childhood, I lived all over the world, uh, traveled all over the world. I lived in France and Germany. And uh, I think I had moved something like 12 times in 16 years by the time I turned 16. That sounds like an army brat. Yes. Know? And then, uh, and then I settled down. My husband and I raised our kids in California in San Diego. And then he came to me one day and said, what do you think if I joined the foreign service, the commercial foreign service? And I said, well, okay, the kids are going to college. Let's do it. And so um, he joined the foreign service and we immediately were sent to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And then we were sent to um, Canada. And then we were sent to the wilds of New Orleans. And now we are in uh, DC as he's learning Romanian. And that's, that will be our next posting in Romania. Well, that's, uh, that's a few miles and a few different cultural <laughs> hotspots in America. It is. Well, it is. Uh, where was the most dangerous per place you ever lived? Oh, Sao Paulo, for sure. Really? So yeah. Why? Why? Um, well, when we arrived there in uh, 2012, um, we were told that if we were accosted by robbers on the sidewalk, just give yeah. them anything they wanted and they wouldn't hurt you. Whoa. Because you have 20 million people living in uh, uh, the city, 8 yeah. million to 9 million cars, and the police cannot get to wherever an incident takes place. So you're on your own. So in 2012, we were told, give them anything they want and they won't hurt you. By the time we left in 2015, that was not the case. You give them anything you want and hope you have enough or they'll hurt you. Oh, so if you didn't have what they wanted or have enough to make them feel rewarded, they would then hurt you. Well, the problem was they were cleaning out Rio de Janeiro for uh, World Cup and the Olympics. So they pushed them out of Rio. They ended up going throughout um, Brazil and into Sao Paulo specifically. So there were turf wars. So a lot of people were fighting for less. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the Brazilian people themselves are fantastic, but the reality of life is that the police just can't get to where the incidents are. So when we lived there, we were like this all the yeah, time. Yeah. We'd come back to the States and we'd lower our shoulders and breathe again. I, yeah. I quit carrying a purse. We carried fake wallets so that uh, if, they, if they, we were robbed, they would get some money and fake IDs, and they would get um, hotel cards that looked like credit cards. Oh, very many clever. Many of them didn't read, so they didn't know what these cards were. Uh, so, uh, very clever. Actually, a very good tip, Ann. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, but if they found out that we had given them those, they got uh, a, a yeah, little th tip. Then you were in trouble. Yeah, yeah. So I, it, it, it was just simply a case of not enough police, too many people, and, and, and no way to get to people. Yeah, yeah. We had friends who had had to cross a bridge to get home every night, and the motorcycles would ride against traffic while they were stopped with one guy driving and the other guy with a gun, and they go car to car pointing the gun and saying, give me what you have. So, yeah, wow. that was tough. A gorgeous, glorious country with wonderful people and just too many, too many crooks. You know, it's, it's interesting here in the U.S. Um, I, I've noticed I, I've noticed less police, at least on the street. I was actually 
talking to a friend last night, talking about Central Expressway in Dallas. And uh, normally, you know, you're going to see a, see a policeman or two yeah. and uh, people pretty much uh, observe the, the speed limit. But I, I, when I drive it, especially after rush hour, it's not unusual for one or two or three cars to pass me going at least 100 miles an hour, anywhere from 80 to 100. Really? Yeah. And it seem, and that seems to be almost every day because I happen to travel that direction uh, in the in the in the evening. But you're seeing it less now. I see it less, and I've seen them less just around in the area. Yeah. So it's noticeable. Well, it's. I would say this is a tough time to be a police officer. Uh, yeah, no kidding, no kidding, yeah, and no appreciation. I, I, so. I admire our, our police. I admire our first responders. They're in a tough time right now. So. Yeah, yeah, they need our our encouragement, and and of course reforms need to be made, and in uh, that area and in different areas. But we definitely don't want to do with do away with them. I can't imagine any sane person wanting to eliminate the police. No, we we have lived where um, guns are outlawed completely, as in Sao Paulo. Yeah, yeah. So only the bad guys and the police have guns. Yeah. And and that's a difficult situation to be in. Um, I I, am, I have no opinion on on gun carry in the U.S., but I just don't think it's a good thing for only the bad guys to have guns. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I need to rethink uh, r- rethink doing away totally with guns because you're right. They're, bad guys are always going to have them. Yeah. So okay, but, well, go ahead. Well, I, I wanted to speak a little bit about your book. Um, I don't know how much you've talked about it on your show. Well, we but, haven't. We ha- haven't much. Oh, you haven't. But, but Anne, yeah, Anne is helping me uh, in, in the editing, and uh, she is. She is, um, she has a big whip. <laughs> and and one, one of the things she told me was that uh, the editor is not your friend. <laughs> well, your friends will tell you that your writing is lovely and the book is perfect, but right. that's not what you pay an editor for. Right. So in that way, they're not your friend, but... But we can be in other ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what you want. You want honest uh, feedback, and you've given me some great, great feedback and, and direction. Well, I want to talk about your book, though, because it is excellent. And uh, especially in our climate right now, people are thinking less about the United States. They're thinking about how torn apart we are. But yeah. your book was so good about you just got on the roads and the back roads often and met people right and it was it is a a rejoicing in our nation which is what i had hoped it would be because john steinbeck didn't really rejoice in the nation he just traveled and and discussed what he saw but you appreciated what you saw and uh for that reason i think people should read your book not only to see the byways and the highways but also to to get your aspect that we are so diverse, and and yet there's much to be proud of here, and much to enjoy. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a great country, and I set out without expectations, so I didn't set out to uh, to praise or to condemn something. I just set right. out to see what I found. Right, and and you made that pretty clear that you were getting your feedback of the United States from media. And so you wanted a more visceral experience. And, yeah, it, uh, and you found much to say that was good. And you also found things to, to uh, criticize. So yeah. I thought it was very well balanced. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, it, it'll be coming out here before long. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it's uh, all done. We just got to just gotta put, put the bow on it, I guess. Yeah, we all get our view of the world of America through the media and the media shapes it one way or the other, whether you read or whether you're watching TV or listen to the radio or podcast. But mostly, especially TV, where a lot of people 
see America. Um, it's very seems to be very distorted today. And that's really what set me off on my trip, because I thought, man, I must be really out of touch with the country I grew up in. And I I, I sort of didn't believe it and, and then sort of maybe thought, well, maybe this is the the America that we're living in, but it looked like everybody was setting each other's hair on fire and dividing up into tribes and ready to cannibalize each other. And when I set out, I found out it was totally different. Most people don't even talk about politics. Right. Uh, You know, they're working hard, they're going home at night and having dinner or whatever, and uh, go out and do something on the weekend before COVID um, or mow their yard or whatever. And I found that very interesting. Well, your book resonated with me for that reason, because when we lived in Canada, we would drive down to California or to Oregon to visit family. So we did a lot of road trips. And then in in the past five years, we've been side to side and top to bottom on the United States. And what we found overall is people just want to basically be left alone to live their lives. Yeah. And to engage with their families and their friends. And uh, we rarely spoke politics. Yeah. We didn't initiate it and it wasn't initiated. I mean, w- whether we were at a diner or stopped uh, somewhere and chatting with the locals, we didn't bring up politics and they didn't either. But we talked about wonderful yeah. things in the world, we talked about problems not related to politics. But overwhelmingly, we found whoever we talked to were mostly positive about prospects, their prospects in life. And they just wanted to be let alone to live their lives. And, and uh, as, as I say, we, we talked to people of all stripes. And that's why your book resounded with me, because you found similar. Yes, exactly. Um... Very similar. And you've written some great blogs about your travels and, and experiences and tossing off, tossing off boat. I say bow lines, but <laughs> some say <laughs> bow lines. So, um, and, and I sailed most of the West Coast and the East Coast and right. Bahamas and other areas on, on my boat when I had it. And, um, and so I guess, you know, I'll go with bow lines, <laughs> which is it's probably not correct. Not the bow lines is fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, toss, toss off, T-O-S-S-O-F-F-B-O-W-L-I-N-E-S dot com. Right. So. Yeah. And, and my, I started that when we started um, the Foreign Service because I, I wanted to share my experiences. I, I'm a writer as well as an editor. I just wanted to share my experiences and, and my, my thoughts about what, I knew we were going to encounter new people and new cultures and new takes on life. And so I, I have some fun things in there where I talk about um, when we went dog sledding in uh, Canada and, and actually drove our own dog sled and stuff. I, I have things, adventures was- like that. What was that like? That had to be an incredible experience. Well, it was fun because I signed us up and uh, I was under the assumption that we would have a guide, someone driving the dog sled. So Tom and I went up there and we arrive and it's only two of us on the sled. There was a caravan of eight sleds and three guides. And they told us we were driving our own sled. So we had a pack of six dogs, a team of six dogs. No kidding. Just took off and so it had snowed heavily the day before as one of the guys said uh, yeah. uh, i thought we were going past little trees but we were at the top of the trees it had it had snowed so much yeah. so um so they showed us how to get the dogs going what to say and they showed us how to use the brake to step on the brake at the back <laughs> and then we were in the middle of the pack and they said go yeah. And and it was it was so much fun but because there was so much snow um when you went up a hill you had to get off and help the the dogs pull the sled. Wow. So Tom had me go first. So he's riding and I'm driving and we hit a little hill and so I hop off but I, I'm trying to run in thigh deep snow and so I'm <laughs> letting the dogs pull me along. 
And the dogs turned around and looked at me, and the lead dog turned around and looked at me and basically said, get your fat arse in gear. <laughs> I had to help push. Yeah. And so that day, I think we went 25 kilometers that day. <laughs> and, and we had to run most of it. And, and uh, I don't run in snow. I don't run much anymore. <laughs> it was such a blast, though. And, and, and that was something we really wanted to do. It was quite Canadian. In Brazil, we did Carnival. We did the Carnival experience. And uh, not in Rio. Yeah. But uh, we did Carnival in uh, Sao Paulo. And so... Well, that we, had to be wild and crazy. It, it was everything you read about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And then in New Orleans, we were in New Orleans for a year and until uh, uh, we got to do a lot until last March. Yeah. Uh, from October to March, we got to do a lot. But uh, after that, of course, of course, COVID shut it down. But we got to enjoy Mardi Gras. We got to enjoy the food. And, and that's the most foreign of all of the U.S. postings we could have had. So it yeah. almost felt like we were overseas. Hmm. Interesting. Did you feel pretty safe there? I did, actually. When I first got there, again, the shoulders were up and it was so different. But yeah. I very, very quickly. It took a year in Sao Paulo for me to like it. Yeah. And in, in New Orleans, it took a week. And, yeah. and the, people, the people in Sao Paulo and the people in New Orleans were just what made the difference. They were such lovely, outgoing, welcoming people. I love New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, I do too. And I love the beignets and the co <laughs> strong coffee with the chicory. Yes, I still drink that. We order it, and, and I prefer that to regular coffee. Well, you know, uh, that's the thing. People, uh, people don't need to sit and watch TV, and, and uh, especially the news these days. Uh, they need to get out and see America and travel this incredible country. Uh, you can... From almost anywhere, I mean, you can get somewhere exotic, sort of, in, uh, you know, a day or two from anywhere you live in America. The best thing, advice I could give to anybody is to get off the interstates. Exactly. Take the local highways. Tom yeah. and I did that all across the South. We drove from, well, as I said, side to side on the states. And often, unless we were in a hurry, uh, we took just state highways, and it's out of the way, but you you run across some marvelous little oddities and treasures, as you write yeah. about in your book, um, the Teapot Cafe that you wrote about. about yeah, tea, teapot, yeah, filling station and yes, yes. Teapot Dome scandal. And <laughs> so uh, if you get off the, if you're on the freeway, uh, the interstate, everything looks the same. It's all the gas stations. It's all the fast food joints. Yeah. Everything looks uh, from end to end in the country. It looks identical. But once you get off, that's when you see the real U.S. And that's when you can stop at a restaurant and have locals come and talk to you. Yeah, yeah. Go uh, go into some of the diners. The uh, yes, the, you're not from around here. Diners. <laughs> the holes in the wall. I mean, in your book, I loved it when you would just choose a place because of the name or because it had that hole in the wall look. Yeah. And, and rarely, I can't think of a time where you were disappointed. You, you might not have gotten the best food, but you were not disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and usually it was incredible food. It wasn't just a standard fare that you get on, the, you know, on those, on those interstates. Right. Uh, road yeah. stops. But also just the interesting people and nice people that you meet uh, yeah, along and, the way. And even if, you know, I always say like, it's like, even if you go to a bad movie or you go to a bad cafe along the way, you go, you walk away with an interesting story. Exactly. <laughs> Something you talk about. You can, you can talk about the bad movie or the bad <laughs> restaurant. But yeah, yeah, I had very few. And, and other th the other thing, Ian, that I found, I'd be interested to see if this has kind of been your experience, but I, I ran across almost, I mean, I'd say virtually 99.999% nice people everywhere. Yeah, you you ran across a few that were curmudgeon -y, a few that had they were intent on their own life and had no time for you. But that's yeah. like that 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 was <laughs> rare for for that to happen. And it's the same for us. Um, if we wherever we stop, whether it was for gas or food or a hotel or yeah. just stop to see something, 
uh, if we made the initial effort, people turned to us and responded. Yeah. I mean, I have to tell you a story. When we, Christmas Christmas Eve a year ago, when we were in New Orleans, they have uh, bonfires on the levees and they've done this for a hundred plus years. Yeah. So we thought, okay, we had our kids with us, uh, our adult kids. We thought, okay, let's go and look at the bonfires on the levee. I hadn't expected to have the crowds, but we were an hour on the freeway just trying to get to them and a massive bonfires. And I said, I have no interest in this. I'm not a huge one for crowds. Yeah. I said, let's go elsewhere on the levee and see what we can find. We hooked a left and we drove maybe four miles and suddenly you had all these little individual, well, individual bonfires. They were probably 10 to 15 feet high, huh. but each family had set one up and they'd spent days building them, had them lit on fire. So we found a place to park climbed up to the levee and just walked among the bonfires. People offered us drinks. They offered us gumbo. They wanted to know who we were and where we were from and what we were doing there. They were just out enjoying the night, the spirit of the evening, and they wanted us to enjoy it too. And that's not uncommon wherever we go. If we engage, they will engage back with us. That's uh, that's a cool story. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't remember about the bonfires, but that that's also a cool tradition. It, it is. Well, it's to light the way for Santa along the uh, uh, along the levees. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. But well, uh, yeah, I, yeah, that's that's you know you can't really create that experience. It just happens because you're out there, and uh, it's not. Maybe maybe everybody can't do it. I don't know. Maybe some people are fearful, but I would urge people to get over that fear and get out there and just experience America. I had a, a similar experience. This was out in California, and I had was going to camp there along the the beach, and there were there were several other RVs lined up uh, in that area, and there were two families who would come together periodically to go to the beach, and. Uh, I happened to pull right between where they normally go, and I was between them. They came over, talked to me, invited me to dinner. We had an incredible time, cooked out over an open fire. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, a a, a memory that will last my lifetime. Exactly, because you happened to go between the two. Yeah, just happened to randomly park. And and you didn't hunt them down in fear because you were interfering with them. I I think if you walk around with – a libation or something to offer food or I I don't know if if you are willing to engage, people will generally engage with you and, and fear. Um, In your book, you are in Seattle and you're with a bunch of people that you're a little bit fearful of, but then you talk to them and you engage with them and they responded. And, And I like to tell the tale of when our kids were little, we went to get ice cream at a Dairy Queen and everyone was sitting along the wall eating like this. Yeah, yeah. What's going on? <laughs> there were some teens there in their 20s and teens with mohawks. And uh, there were goths and things like that. Yeah. And so they were cowing everybody who was in the Dairy Queen and enjoying yeah. that fact. Yeah. So we went in and got our ice cream and then there was no place to sit. So we went outside among these goths and and these others and we're sitting there eating and their kids eyes are like this big and i'm staring at a young guy across from me who had like a a 10 inch mohawk (laughs) and i'm eating my ice cream and he's eating his and finally i said can i ask you a question he said sure i said how do you sleep with that he goes oh it's funny i just push it down he became super engaged in telling me the story and his buddies were all standing there you know looking so aloof and everything ended up gathering over and then they start talking about their piercings and things ended up they invited he invited our kids to go to uh barnes and noble where he where he worked and he was going to show them music and stuff yeah but it was funny because I knew that they were having fun cowing everybody, but I also yeah. knew there was nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. And as soon as I engaged with them, 
it all changed. But everyone else in the store, you know, was so fearful of them. And so I I like to think that my our, our kids engage with people all the time. And I think they saw that in particular, but many times in their life and recognized yeah. it's okay not to be afraid. It's okay to step outside of your comfort zone. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I, uh, we could go on forever. We'll have to do this again. We'll continue this conversation another time. And uh, basically we're encouraging people to get out and experience life, travel, <laughs> And, and right now, it's the perfect time in the States. You can't travel overseas, so get out and see the States. But if you want to, you, you better make your RV reservations very quickly because they're going quickly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, things are going to open up. And, and, and if you're cautious, take the precautions during the time of COVID. You'll hopefully, you know, just be okay. I mean, that's that's basically what I've done. I don't want to be afraid of my shadow, but I do take precautions. So I don't want to get it. The, so, the, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, so the websites toss off bow lines. There's no the in there. Right. Hey, thank you very much for taking the time and for talking this afternoon. It's always a pleasure, John.